Okay, in this video, we're going to deal with this equation you see at the top of the slide called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Now, what, what does this have to do with biology? This equation written up here essentially says that in a population, if this equation is true, then it is called in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, meaning that there is no micro evolution occurring. And what do I mean by microevolution? Microevolution just means a change in allele frequencies in the population. So if this equation is true, then there is not going to be changes in the allele frequencies or the gene frequencies from one generation to the next in a population. But that is an unlikely event. In, in most situations, a population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because there are changes from one generation to the next in the allele frequencies. Now let's look at some of the conditions that would have to be true for a population to remain in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, meaning that there would not be any microevolution, there would not be changes in the allele frequencies. So the first condition that we'll talk about is there cannot be any mutations in the DNA sequence. So in other words, we have no changes from one allele to the next, and we have we can have no new alleles that are occurring because of random mutations. So this is one condition that must be true. Therefore, if we look over on the other side and say if a population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or if a population is having microevolution occur or having seeing changes in allele frequency, then we would say, okay, mutations occurring would be one condition that would cause a population not to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Now, let's look at another condition. Um, if a population is to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we say, okay, excuse me, there can be no genetic drift. And I'm going to explain to you what genetic drift is, but over here on this side, I'm going to say if there is genetic drift, then that is going to shift a population out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And there's two types of genetic drift specifically that I'm going to talk about. One is called the bottleneck effect, and the other is called the founder effect. Okay, so let's have a look at those. So let's just talk for just a second about the founder effect. Now this link, if you go to the description of the video, you can click on this link and read more about this story here. But essentially what this is, is um, addressing is the Amis population that live in the state of Pennsylvania. Okay, and so um, back at the very beginning when this population first set up, there were about 200 individuals that immigrated um, from Europe that set up this original population. And these individuals then, that's such a small number of people compared to the larger population in which they came from, that um, you basically are going to see a higher concentration of whatever genes or alleles types that they carried with them, including any gene mutations in this population because not only was this population founded by 200 individuals, a very small number, that couldn't possibly represent all the alleles from their um, original population, but also based on the culture of the Amish, they tend to marry others from that same area in their same group. Therefore, the gene mutations or any types of alleles are, are concentrated within that one population. So a founder effect can be true with animals also, any kind of species, but essentially what you see is um, whatever genes or alleles um, that the founders bring with them are definitely um, disproportionately represented in the population because the population is made up of so few individuals. Um, that they just can't possibly represent the whole starting population.
population. Now the bottleneck effect um, is also genetic drift and I just want to back up a minute and say genetic drift we're gonna when we talk about genetic drift both either the bottleneck effect or the founder effect both of these we say are occurring by chance it's not an, ev an environmental pressure that's occurring for this to happen it's it's by chance that this type of um, change in a little frequency occurs but the bottleneck effect if we look at this little cartoon representation down here we see that let's say we had this many marbles to start with we had red yellow green pink and red uh, purple and then because of some um, event that occurred like perhaps a tornado or a flood some kind of catastrophe uh, a great number of these marbles or in a case of a population individuals would not survive and in that case, then, if we look at the colors that are represented, we see a definite change in the percentage of, of alleles or colors of marbles that are left. Okay, And as we move um, after another uh, catastrophe or event like that where the population is severely limited, so you're down to very few members of the original population, then we see that we no longer even have some of those allele frequencies or gene frequencies even represented any longer. So we see in this population we don't have yellow represented any longer and we don't have the pink marble represented any longer. So a good example in nature of this occurring would be the cheetah population because of the loss of their habitat and poaching and hunting. They have been severely drastically reduced in the number of cheetahs and the genetic variation there is just not, it cannot capture all of the alleles that were in the original population. But with either of these, it's not a selection pressure from the environment that is, that is limiting some of these alleles. It is simply by chance, these 200 individuals started a new um, population. And so whatever rep alleles were represented in that population are, were by chance. Same thing when, when a population goes through a drastic reduction in numbers. Um, it's, it's simply just by chance that some of those allele frequencies or allele types are eliminated from the population. So let's go back. We've covered a couple of conditions. If a population is to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have no mutation. We have no genetic drift. And the next condition would be no natural selection. And so we have a video on natural selection. And if you, oops, excuse me, selection. And if you haven't seen that video, this would be a good time to go back and watch it. Obviously, natural selection occurring then would be setting a population outside of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. I'm just going to take a second to look at one example of natural selection. So, natural selection essentially, we've heard the term survival of the fittest, which is sort of true, um, except and for an organism to be fit in this condition, what that would mean is it would survive long enough to be of reproductive age and it would have reproductive success, meaning it's passing on its alleles to the next generation because that's what we're looking at from one generation to the next. What are the allele frequencies? So if some organisms have better survivability to get to the age of reproduction and therefore can pass on their alleles, then they would be considered fitter organisms or the fittest because they are contributing in as far as alleles are concerned to the next generation. Now you see here two different phenotypes of what's called the peppered moth. So over here we'll call this the white phenotype. Okay, it's lighter in color and we'll call this the dark phenotype. And this is an interesting example. Um, so let's say back uh, many years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, these moths were sampled and about 99% of the moths represented this phenotype. They had the whiter phenotype. Okay, when you look at the, the environment in which these moths lived, they would land on the bark of particular trees that were covered with lichens, which were light colored. So what this, what this phenotype did for this moth is it allowed it to be very camouflaged as it was um, against the bark of the tree. Therefore, when the predators, which were birds, came along, the, this particular phenotype wasn't visible 
um, against the bark of the tree with the light colored lichens on there. This colored moth, however, was much more visible. The darker color showed up, therefore more likely for predators to see them and be able to capture the moth. After the Industrial Revolution, there was much pollution that darkened the bark of the trees and also caused problems for the lichens that were living on the bark of the trees. And when there was a sample done of the phenotypes of these moths in 1959, after the Industrial Revolution, of course, 90% of the moths had this darker phenotype, simply because of the change in the environment. So if we look at the moths, okay, and we say, how did this affect the population? Well, before the Industrial Revolution, those that had this phenotype, the predators could see them better. They would get uh, captured before the age of reproductive success, couldn't pass on the alleles. After the Industrial Revolution then, because the environment in which they found themselves more, the bark of the trees changed. So the actual bark was darker, therefore these no longer had the same camouflage ability. They now suddenly showed up um, much clearer to the predators, therefore they're getting um, eliminated before the age of reproduction. And the darker moths then um, are surviving, passing on their genes, and after multiple generations, we see that the majority of the population then looks like the darker moth. Um, if there were to be a change in the bark of the trees again, then if they were lighter in color, you would expect to see a shift back to the lighter phenotype because, again, the camouflage ability is what's causing the, quote, selection of certain traits over others. Now let's go back and look at another uh, condition. And so in this case, if we want, if a population is to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, there can be no gene flow. Therefore, over here, we know that any gene flow can mean a change in uh, allele frequency, therefore microevolution. Um, and gene flow uh, simply means that if you have two populations, so we have population A over here has this, the phenotype big H, big H, which gives this particular blue coloration. And then we have population B over here that has a little h, little h genotype, which yields this red colored phenotype. If we have um, one of these population A birds that migrates and joins this population, then we're now going to see um, a change in the allele frequencies because we have a sudden influx of an, a, a gene or an allele that did not exist in this population. Same thing if this bird travels to this population, we're still going to see a change in allele frequencies even though we don't see a change in phenotype. There's been the introduction of the homozygous uh, I mean, excuse me, the recessive allele into population A where we have a, the, the dominant allele into population B. So either way, if you have new alleles coming or going from a population, that's going to change the allele frequencies. Therefore, population will no longer be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And the last condition that I want to talk about is there has to be random mating occurring. So no particular selection in mating. So then the opposite of that would be if it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we would say non-random mating, or we might call it sexual selection. Okay, so we can think of many examples. Um, for example, let's look at birds. So many times a bird is choosing a mate based on the color of feathers or the type of song um, that the bird is chirping, or perhaps even their ability to build a nest. So these would be examples of choosing a mate based on certain traits, which would be sexual selection, and you would expect to see that that, that would influence the next generation so that that could certainly be a change in allele frequencies. So tune in for the next video of Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium. Thank you very much. Thank you.